Good morning, I'm Ken Bibri, and welcome to Coffee with Ken, a thought leadership series at the nexus of business and politics. In the news today, President Biden and Speaker McCarthy are meeting today on the debt ceiling crisis. Turkey's presidential election heads to a runoff with President Erdogan in the lead. Today's topic is effective border management through technology, and we're joined by Carla Provost, former chief of the U.S. Border Patrol, Ha McNeil, EVP at Pangeum, Andrea Garrity, Chief Growth Officer at Gotenna. Wonderful to see you, ladies. How are you? Good. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah. So, so every once in a while, we'll plan one of these coffee conversations, and it happens to land on like a very important time or date or you know situation. And I don't think we could have timed this one more perfect with the expiration of Title Forty Two last Thursday, Friday. Uh, so why don't we start there, Carla? You know. You're on the front lines or you were on the front lines for a long time. Give us a quick 101 on, you know, what it means with the expiration of uh, Title 42 and and what's the kind of state of play on the southern border uh, that we saw over the weekend and what we can expect in the weeks to come. Sure, Ken. Thanks so much again, as Andrea said. Thanks for having us. And I'm just excited to be here with Andrea and, and with Ha. Um, well, a lot going on, as you said, right? Title 42 expiring, but I, you know, I think it's a lot bigger than that. If, if people have been looking at the numbers here recently, um, they have not seen a huge increase in traffic since Title 42 has expired. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that the secretary got out and made a statement in front of it. That being said, I don't know that that is really long lived. When you look at, at the last decade, really, and what's been going on along the border, um, We've seen a big shift in demographics. It, it really is a worldwide migration crisis that's going on. Um, when I was a young agent in the Border Patrol a very long time ago, <laughs> pre-9-11, most of the migrants that were coming across were um, Mexican nationals, Central Americans, coming across working, heading back home, um, and then coming back during the certain times of, of year for employment. And we've really seen over the last decade a shift in demographics. And I say the last decade because in 2014 is really when unaccompanied, we started to see a surge in unaccompanied minors coming across. And that has not let up. Family members coming across. And then really this becoming a worldwide issue. Um, last year, the CBP encountered people from over 150 countries at our borders. So we are seeing a, a big demographic shift over the last decade. Um, Title 42, obviously, as I, I know many people know, due to the pandemic, allowed CBP to process instead of under Title 8, which is, is how we process from the time I came in, which is uh, the, the U.S. code that uh, oversees the immigration, um, they were able to use the uh, Title 8 public health and welfare um, mm -hmm. uh, to process folks and to remove them because of not wanting to put people into congregate settings when we're dealing with a pandemic. So it changes some things, but it's really not new for CBP. It's going back to what CBP knew before pre-pandemic. Title VIII is how they had been processing individuals in the past. Uh, but as we've seen the last few years, the numbers continue to increase, and that's not a good thing. Um, it cr creates this humanitarian crisis with the sheer numbers, CBP encountered 2.7 million people last year, which was record breaking. 2.2 uh, million of those between the ports of entry and are on track to see those numbers go up even higher this year, right now. So this is something that we need to talk about, we need to deal with it. And certainly there's opportunities for um, technology and industry to support the government in their efforts to uh, try to get the border under control. So, so, Andrea, let's pivot to you a little bit about that and, and technology. And I think when we were chatting last week, it's not just about like tech innovation, it's also about like process innovation, right? Like talk a little bit about how you think technology and maybe the private sector can kind of be a resource as we deal with the border issues. Absolutely. So, Ken, I might actually take a step back and then come back to your question. So if you think about what Customs and Border Protection does as a whole, right, it's really about... Um, you know, allowing the free kind of movement of people and goods into and out of the United States, right? So there's a much broader mission here. There's a trade mission, there's a lawful travel mission, there's a lawful immigration mission, you know, all of these things that CBP is part of. 
we tend to get very focused on the border patrol mission, which is what's happening along the southern border, you know, primarily is what we hear, but the northern border as well. And border patrol is really focused on, you know, the areas of, of land, of crossings, where kind of in between legal points of entry, right? So legal points of entry might be, uh, you know, a, 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 a a car, you know, vehicle crossing um, along the border. It's it's airports, right? And so you see border patrol in areas where there shouldn't be illegal crossings. And then you see the Office of Field Operations, you know, those are the agents in navy blue who are at the airports when you're going through customs. So CBP has a very, very broad mission. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's frustrating to see it get boiled down just to what's sure. happening at the border. But I also think that, you know, going to what Carla said, you know, the past probably eight years, I mean, I think administration agnostic, we've seen significant increase in numbers of illegal crossings. Mm -hmm. And so digging into, you know, why is that happening? What is driving people to make what is a very dangerous journey to engage with cartels to pay them to human traffic them across the border? You know, what's happening elsewhere that's driving this change? And then, of course, you know, going to what we were just talking about with Title 42, during the pandemic, there was... Um, you know, Title 42 was in place, which did help to kind of stem some of that crossing and then the processing and then the downstream effects that come from that. And of course, with Title 42 expiring, while there has been a decrease in the past, you know, few days, I think the the long term effect is is yet to be determined and likely, you know, we're going to see increased numbers of crossings. So, yeah, good. I was going to say break, break, um, you know. With that in mind, I think when it comes to talking about innovation and technology, you know, we can't afford to not use tech to help, A, move those, you know, legal things through people, trade, travel, right? And also, you know, how do we quickly address, you know, some of the process work that has to happen? Um, you know, how do we do that, whether it's through communications, whether it's through AI, whether it's through um you know, other sorts of innovation, which might not be tech related. It might be how do we, you know, choose to engage um, with individuals. So, you know, I'll, I'll stop there for a second. No, yeah, but but I, I feel like that's a perfect kind of segue to you, Ha. I mean, your previous background at TSA and now at PNGM, right? You're focused on this kind of seamless ability to allow people and goods to to pass through our borders. Like, talk a little bit about how you're spending your day-to-day -day lessons learned from your public sector experience and and how you evaluate the situation. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, as you mentioned, Pangeum is really focused on the seamless movement of people and goods uh, and enabling that with technology, right? But so right now with Title 42 and, and the situation on the border, compound that, right, with, um, you know, other growth areas, increases in legitimate trade, right? Um, uh, increase, year-over-year -year increase in, in aviation travel, 5% year-over-year, right? The rebound post-COVID. These are all putting incredible demands on the DHS workforce. Um, and traditionally, the way we resource these processes are very much kind of one-to-one, -one, right? And, and approaching it in a uh, kind of, you know, one officer, one, one passenger type of interaction. And technology really enables uh, the workforce to be um, even more efficient in their delivery of, of their mission, right? Um, be, be able to um, really tackle the growth in numbers. So without that inter introduction of, of uh, you know, new processes, new technologies combined with empowering that workforce, it's, it's a difficult situation, right? But, but the good news is, you know, you bring those combinations together and, and you can see, you know, solutions really um, come to bear. Mm. So, so Carla, <laughs> Border Patrol doesn't have limitless resources, right? So, so there's been this talk of a border tax. Talk about what, what that means and then what uh, other resources are available or get kind of, you know, activated to support yeah. surge needs and so on. Well, I, as, as you said, whenever we have to surge or whenever the Border Patrol has to surge um, in particular, and OFO as well, I mean, they are getting hit with uh, higher numbers. And as Andrea and Ha have said, you know, they also at the same time have to facilitate legal trade and, and travel and all of this. And it's really impressive uh, just to digress for a moment uh, how far they've come with technology when it comes to our ports of entry, whether it's our seaports, land ports, airports. Um, it, and 
certainly moving in the right direction when you consider the amount of travelers every day coming in and out of this country legally. So compound that with the illegal migration that we are seeing that is affecting between the ports of entry border patrol and often at the ports of entry as well. Uh, CBP and OFO uh, or border patrol and OFO work hand in hand in dealing with that. But uh, you're right, Un they do not have unlimited resources. Um, manpower has not been increasing either to the level that they need. And this is where technology can support in some of those areas because um, something that CBP consistently does because they have to when they have surges is move their people around mm -hmm. and detail the folks in and they are dealing with um, you know, large numbers of families and children who have made a, a treacherous journey up here. It's a toll on the workforce. Huh. Um, many of them are detailed far from home. Northern border uh, agents and officers detail, detailed down to the southern border, coastal as well, detailed in. Um, just the type of work that they are having to deal with uh, in, in the humanitarian mission, too, now that really has transitioned over the last few years um, and some of, unfortunately, the the uh, things that they have to deal with on a day to day basis and see nobody wants to see children and families going through what they're going through. Uh, the border is a dangerous place, uh, particularly between the ports of entry. Um, obviously, as you hear CBP say in uh, time and time again, they do not want people crossing between the ports of entry. You don't want people putting them, themselves in the hands of smugglers who do not care about them who care about making money and some of the tragedies that you see for these migrants um, that are you know, coming up, trying to make a better life for themselves. We've got to find a way to fix our broken immigration system, to allow more people to come legally. And then we need to be able to enforce the laws too, because we are a nation of laws. Um, and you know, we don't want to be encouraging people to come illegally. It is so dangerous. It's so treacherous. And then the workforce sees that day in and day out. They already work long hours. They're detailed away from home. They're running across all different kinds of tragedies um, along the border. And it's it's just it's an amazing workforce to see what they do. But you you can't help but feel for them because they do the best that they can with limited resources. So anywhere that technology can come in and support their efforts is critical moving forward because that workforce is not growing at, at a level that it needs to be to handle this uh, mass migration that we're dealing with. Hmm. Well, and I would add to that, right? Like I contrast kind of what happened during COVID and then just what I see, you know, with companies in general, right? So COVID, so many people were working from home and were yeah. remote. Border Patrol and other law enforcement entities had to show up every day and they did, right? And then when I look at it now, you know, we interview candidates and we're a remote first company, but there are a lot of people who don't want to go into the office and they want to be remote. And, you know, that's not an, an option for a Border Patrol agent or for, again, anybody in kind of federal, state and local law enforcement. What I think is different with Border Patrol, as Carla was mentioning, is that when there is a surge, um, you know, or when we're expecting an increase in crossings, we're taking people who, you know, live on the northern border or live in other parts of the country and we're sending them to the southern border, not for a week or two weeks, but sometimes indefinitely for months, right? We're taking them away from their families and their communities and their support system. And we're seeing kind of that mental health uh, challenge start to play out, right? Um, and that is a problem, right? This is this is not just about people crossing the border. It's all of these interconnected pieces. How do we take care of our workforce? How do we take care of people who are crossing? How do we encourage legal immigration? How do we fix the system to do that? And by the way, what are the downstream effects, not just for border states and border cities anymore, but long-term as we're moving people to other parts of the country, how do we staff our schools to have the resources to deal with the trauma of, of kids who are who are now in these systems, right? Um, how are we staffing hospitals? How are we going to, you know, going back to schools, right? The Washingtonian just had an interesting article about teachers who are taking on second jobs because their, you know, salary isn't enough to live on. Like, how are, if we're staffing, I mean, if we're increasing enrollment at schools, how are we staffing those things? So again, you know, to me, there's so many things that are interconnected here. It, it's hard to boil it down to a tweet of what's right or wrong. Yeah. No, interesting. So, yeah. Hi, go ahead. 
I was going to say, I think, you know, we're just seeing the, the nature of an already complex situation becoming even more complex as you're seeing dispersion, right, of those crossing the borders into, um, you know, broader communities across, across the country. Um, and for me, it brings into focus, like, how do we, you know, we putting my old DHS hat on, but like, how do we do better at service delivery? What tools can we equip ourselves with, right? to do to make sure that we deliver in a timely, accurate manner. And a lot of that is around kind of information and identity management and just, you know, I mean, pace management and all of this stuff is technology uh, enabling, um, you know, areas. And um, really that service delivery, I think, is really critical. And, you know, that, that cuts across all the mission space of, of DHS. Yeah. So just at a macro level, how much of our broader national policy is reactive versus strategic, right? Like, I feel like a lot of these conversations and these veins that we're talking about are just, we have a crisis in the schools we need to deal with. We're having a surge at the border. So other agencies, Secret Service, FBI, everybody needs to send their resources to activate at this moment. And how are we thinking about commerce and the free flow of goods to make sure we have supply chain, you know, protection, all of this, like, is there part of a broader comprehensive national strategy or Unfortunately, I kind of feel like some of this is happening in silos, and then you overlay local government and municipalities that are stretched thin themselves and dealing with all kinds of other issues, right? And now these are not just geographies down in California, New Mexico, Texas, Arizona, Florida, right? This is the entire country. We have Mayor Adams in New York speaking out about needing resources to deal with migrants in New York City, Mayor Bowser in D.C., and elsewhere, right? So I know that was a lot, but just more broadly, are we lacking a strategic approach to this more nationally? I would say 100%. This is something, at, you know, for the, the 25 years I was in the Border Patrol, and it's, you know, that's been 28 years now since that has been a, a topic of discussion. And you mentioned it, Andrea mentioned it, this is bigger than just a border issue. Um, this is impacting the entire country. It's impacting federal level, state levels, agencies that never thought that they would have anything to do with, um, you know, the border. Uh, so it, it's it's a tough issue. It's something that everybody likes to talk about and have opinions about, but we've got to come together and be proactive. You're exactly right. Everything has been reactive. Um, not that it, you know, you haven't had agencies talking about the things that they've needed, but you've got to get Congress work, working with the executive branch, working with the states, working with the local communities that are impacted. Um, as I spoke about that demographic shift, People will go back and point to numbers that maybe in, in you know, 2000, we were up at a high mark of 1.6 or close to, to 2 million. Totally different, though. People were coming and going back home. People are coming and staying now. And this does have an impact on all of those social systems within the country. And we're not ready for it. We really, really aren't. Medical facilities. Um, you know, dealing with it besides the schools that Andrea talked about, all of the, the cities, the impacts there, all of our social services. Um, it's time for us to come together and, and stop talking about it and really come up with solutions. And it is not easy. Anybody who insinuates that it is, is, is wrong. We've, well, we've been working this. All of the three of us here have been dealing with this for decades now. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy fix. Um, but we've got to get to a, I'm just going to say it, to a bipartisan relationship where people can come together and we can address this, or it is going to have huge, it already is having huge impacts on communities. It's only going to get worse. And I, I would just say, right, at a, at a high level, Civics 101, Congress makes an act agencies like CBP enforce the laws. So, you know, when we want to kind of blame agencies for their behavior or something that's happening, right, what we really need to do to, to Carla's point is go back to that congressional level and say, okay, what is the strategy? And then what are the laws that get put into place to enact the strategy? Got it. Uh, take us through a little bit of like the evolution of technology and its role in supporting government, right? Like we, we've been on this little thread on previous talks thinking about how, you know, Silicon Valley and the Pentagon in the 50s and 60s had a really close working relationship. And then the tech sector kind of, you know, separated from 
the defense industry and national security and it's more social media and Facebook, et cetera. But I, I kind of see in the last five years, there's been a resurgence of companies like Pangeum, Anduril, Gotenna, right? There seems to be more brain power, thought and innovation kind of coming toward government in a new way that's kind of disrupting the traditional primes and procurement and so on. So how where are we in this kind of tech cycle? How is government responding to the need to get new innovation? And, and what kind of criticism maybe do you have about procurement and speed and efficiency? I mean, I know that's a lot and I'd love to hear from all of you, but how maybe take that a little bit on just the tech side? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think in the last 10 years or so, you've seen this growth of uh, innovation teams across agencies and government, right? And then they've become resourced over time. And so they're actually be have the ability to tap into some cutting edge innovations and, and deploying them for proofs of concepts, or at least, you know, getting the tech out there so that um, uh, those law enforcement, you know, officers can, you know, yeah. work with the tech, have a look and feel of it and all of that, right? So so that, that kind of really, um, I think, uh, grew over the last 10 years. And then you're seeing the other more traditional uh, processes within government start to evolve to then take those innovations and then grow them at scale. Um, and that is the critical part that I think is, is really important to make sure that we follow through on, right? What is our acquisition process, our procurement process? How do we tighten that cycle? Right from uh, you know from from uh, you know discovery to fielding, uh, and and that is that is kind of an area of focus for me anyways, and an area of passion for me because I think without those improvements in those processes, it's going to be really hard for government to deploy technology at pace with technological uh, innovations. So to really be able to do that, you know, there's there's some homework that needs to be done, right? And I think government agencies are wrapping their heads around how do they do testing differently, right? Um, so all of these things are really, really important. Um, and, and I would say that one thing that Pangeum really, really believes in is uh, breaking through the stronghold of kind of traditional government providers and really enabling an open architecture environment. And just if you could bear with me, I'm gonna geek out a little bit around open architecture, but what does that mean, yeah. right? So historically, if you build a system for government, it's very close. You provide the hardware, the software, the maintenance, and everything is packaged up nicely and it's provided by one company. In this new world, what we're looking at is how does one hardware provider then work with maybe third-party algorithm providers? Because people who develop software are good at developing software, but not good at developing hardware. But how do you tap into that ecosystem of expertise? Hmm. Right. And really bring the advantages to bear for the government mission, for the passengers, you know, those crossing the border, et cetera. Yeah. So um, from a kind of, uh, you know, principal perspective, open architecture, I think, is, is something that's really quite important, uh, along with those government uh, improvements and processes. And Andre, I think we started chatting last week a little bit about a startup ecosystem, right? And having, you know, getting back to kind of having a strategy and an approach, right? Like, what are your thoughts on how we do this? Absolutely. So, I mean, I've spent just so much of, of my career focused on the innovation startup government space. It's kind of mm -hmm. like my soapbox and I'm, I'm sure I'm going to step up on it here, but um, I just think it's such an important part of, you know, what the government needs to kind of continue to move forward and to keep pace with what's happening, you know, on a societal level. Um, I think innovation to me is really about partnership. Uh, it's about companies and the government or or companies and companies, right, coming together to say, how do we best enable the mission? How do we understand what it is that you actually need and then deliver that technology to you and not just to the organization, but how do we get that 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 piece of tech through the organization to the person who needs to use it? Right. So how do you get, you know, Gotenna does mesh radio communications, we move, you know, the most important data, GPS location, text messages, and kind of sensor related data in an environment where there's no other form of communication. So, you know, when we think about, you know, we all think cellular service is ubiquitous, I can tell you it's not, right? There is no cell service along the border, there's no Wi Fi, there's other countries where that doesn't exist. So having, you know, comms, at the speed of mission, right, where you can kind of know, where am I, where is my team? Uh, how do I communicate? How do I get help for a migrant who's crossing, who's dehydrated in the middle of the desert and I need a medevac, right? That uh, that technology becomes really important. But it's, you know, it, it's not 
relevant if we can't get those radios to Border Patrol agents mm -hmm. if they sit at the headquarters level. So mm -hmm. it's moving tech to the right people. And one of the things that I've learned over time is that innovation and sourcing technology and finding that next really interesting capability is a lot of fun. Taking it through the process that aligns with, you know, U.S. law and regulation, right? Doing like, you know, procurement evaluations to make sure there's fair and open competition, uh, taking things through privacy impact assessments, through the authority to test and authority to operate, meaning that, you know, this information, this you know, device can touch a government network. That part is kind of a slog yeah. and really not exciting. And so to me, part of, uh, you know, enabling innovation is making sure that you're letting the people who do the mission do the mission and you're getting them the tech and you have other people who are supporting them in kind of that administration, administrative process to make sure that like we are aligned with the laws, we are doing all the right things, but like a border patrol agent doesn't have time to go through that process. No, so, and just to break it down a little bit more, I think you even talked about when we were discussing last week about the number of different agencies down there. They're all in different communication systems and like just a real world impact. Just talk 10 seconds about that. I mean, it never occurred to me. You could have one vehicle with like three different people from three different agencies and they're all on different comms. Like, so from a protection of the individuals to the migrants, to the broader system. And I mean. Yeah. So, I mean, if you think about like, what you might see locally with local law enforcement or what you see in the movies, right? Everybody busts out their big radio and they're talking on the radios and they're communicating with everybody and, you know, everything is awesome, right? Uh, in the in the U.S. space, every agency and generally, you know, even state and locals, they kind of have their own channels on a radio. So, you know, if I'm on Channel 5 and I work with the FBI, everybody's on Channel 5, but CBP might be on Channel 7, and so when we're responding to a joint operation, whether it's at the border or someplace else, our radios don't talk. So if I'm an FBI agent, I'm not talking to a Border Patrol agent. So what ends up happening is you have, you know, a squad or a team leader who's sitting in a vehicle with a radio from every group that they're working with. So it might be I've got an FBI radio, I've got a CBP radio, I've got a Secret Service radio, I've got a Houston Police Department radio. And if something goes wrong and I'm not sure where transmission came from, I'm picking up each radio and I'm going retransmit, retransmit, retransmit to find the information. Um, you know, these were things that were meant to be resolved after 9-11 and I think have just been harder challenges to tackle. So one of the things from a Gotenna perspective, again, we're just moving kind of GPS location information and text messages, but we can self-tune the radio so everybody's on that same channel. So now maybe you still have all your voice radios, but you're sending a text going, hey, here's the problem or here's the building, here's the place. And, you know, anybody that's part of that operation can see that information. Um, so, you know, there's things like that 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 seem like uh, they're, you know, issues that should have been resolved previously that are just still part of the everyday, um, you know. Yeah. And, and, yeah. Carla, I'll give you a chance. I mean, you were down there 25 years like talk about what you saw on the front lines from resources technology i mean well yeah. to that point and to what andrea was talking about i mean to see how far we've come and it is amazing there's always further to go but um you, you know i think about what she was just discussing and what gotenna provides to the agents and this was something that while i was the chief uh this connectivity was uh, something i was very passionate about uh, for multiple reasons. We had a blue on blue incident and lost an agent um, uh, in Naco, uh, Arizona, because of lack of, of no, you know, that connectivity and knowing who was whom. And then when you look at the how this can help save lives with the rescues, the technology, the connectivity, agents and officers being able to get out. A lot of people don't really realize, Andrea mentioned it, but the border is so vast and so remote in some locations. We used to say, we like to say in CBP, if you've been to one location on the border, you've been to one location on the border because it is so different, whether you're in California, Arizona, Texas, New Mexico, and then the Northern border is a, a whole nother entity and, you know, a, a different threat picture up there, but certainly a lot of, 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 of areas of concern. So, bringing this tech in that can support and fill those gaps mm -hmm. and help protect the men and women who are protecting us that are on the front lines and help them to save lives. And I, I just want to mention the saving lives aspect of it because 
The Border Patrol in particular does not get enough credit for what they do on their humanitarian mission. They rescued over 22,000 people last year. Um, you know, everybody likes to talk when there's a tragedy and something goes wrong, but nobody recognizes what these men and women go out and do. They risk their lives to save other lives. And there have been agents and officers who have lost their lives saving other people. Um, so this technology, the connectivity, being able to help protect the men and women that wear the uniform and being able to help save migrants' lives, it's critical to their operations. So seeing how far we've come is just absolutely amazing. Knowing that there are companies out here supporting the government uh, like Gotenna, like Pangea, that are, are there really trying to help those men and women on the front line, that's what it's all about. Yeah, that's amazing. So, so how, let's just take a step back on kind of the borders and, you know, the free flow of people in commerce, right? Like we were talking a lot about the southern border and the northern border, but planes, boats, commerce, like talk a little bit more about how maybe the tech enablement, enablement differs, you know, whether you're talking about, you know, people coming in on airports and that speed. How do we think about technology and implementation at different ports of entry for different reasons, right? Like maybe it's humanitarian priority at the southern border or it's, you know, ports about commerce or just business travel or leisure travel, you know, to make it more seamless and make our country more welcoming, right? At the same time, we have this policy of just like, we have strict borders and communication matters and words matter and you can't come illegally. But we sure as heck want you to come here as often and frequent as possible to spend your money at Disneyland and visit our monuments and visit our national parks and so on, right? And we want to be able to do the same elsewhere. So how does tech kind of, you know, enable that in a seamless way as well? Yeah, I, I think the the driver here is um, to allocate the very scarce human resource, right, at these ports of entries, airports and all that on the things that they need to look at. And the rest of it, just keep it moving, <laughs> Right, and so technology really does enable that. So if it's pass and, uh, passenger processing, right? Well, we don't care about every, 99% of the people who come through, not a concern. We know, you know, they've got their paperwork in, in place and all of that. Um, you know, we, we know they have visas, passports, just move them through and then use the scarce human resource to have that interaction, that one-on-one -on -one interaction with uh, that smaller percentage of people who might be of interest, right? Same on the trade side. Uh, we move, you know, thousands and thousands of containers. Most of it is le legitimate and compliant with our trade rules. Um, but how do we leverage technology like imaging and AI ML solutions to identify that threat area and have the officer really focus on that? And the rest just keep it moving. I mean, at the the rate, um, you know, passenger and trade flows are increasing. Unless we move to that, like we're not going to be able to kind of, you know, process that speed, right? And and the demand just keeps increasing. Mm -hmm. um, taking a step back on policy, right? Like we want to call to action what needs to be done. Uh, we've talked a little bit about comprehensive immigration reform, maybe worker visas, resources to the border. What are the policy kind of recommendations that you would have, right? Like if you were testifying on the Hill tomorrow, like, you know, what are the top priorities you would think to kind of alleviate humanitarian issues to secure, you know, national security, but then also to kind of promote our country as a place that is welcoming for commerce and goods and people and so on. No pressure. Could be your platform for Congress, Carla. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Absolutely not. Well, obviously, you know, my me spending my career in the Border Patrol, I I do get uh, heavily focused on the between the ports of entry and and mm -hmm. uh, the just the amount of illegal immigration, the dangers that come with it, as I stated earlier, for the migrants that are coming here. And it, we immigration reform, we absolutely have to address it. So that really is my my top um, issue. We've got to find ways for um, to better vet those that are coming to allow more people to come, you know, legally. And then we do, we have to have laws. We are a nation. Uh, you have to have borders. Nations have borders. I know a lot of people, it's a tough uh, subject because you are looking at a worldwide humanitarian crisis. We're not the only ones getting hit. We're getting hit the hardest probably with mass migration, but you can look to Europe and look at what's going on there. Um, it goes back to the, the demographic shift that I said uh, that CBP and the Border Patrol has seen over the last 10, 20 years. Um, this is not something that's going away. It's not something that we can push off. We've seen it um, you know, continue to increase. Uh, and I think we've got to look 
even bigger than the U.S. You've got to look at NATO. You've got to look at, at all of these um, countries coming together and trying to address what are those push and pull factors. Um, because countries can't take on everyone. Countries like the U.S. just cannot take on everyone. So how do we help in the sending countries? How do we help improve over there? And it, none of this is easy. It really, really isn't. But that's where, you know, I guess if I uh, had that uh, magic wand to work with our our uh, uh, lawmakers, those are the areas that I would want to see them focusing on uh, to address the situation and and to um, support our men and women on the border as well as they are doing a very, very tough job, uh, harder than most people know. Andre? You know, I'm like looking off to the side here. It, it's, a, it's a really hard question. I, I think there's a couple of different ways I would approach it if I could wave a magic wand and make things the way I wanted them to be. I think one is societal. As mm -hmm. a society, what is our expectation for border security and bringing new people into the country? Right. And we can't say we're going to pay for everybody and pay for everything. And we're seeing that start to play out, as you mentioned earlier. Right. Like Mayor Adams is saying we need funding, we need help. But on the flip side, you know, hey, we want to we want to welcome everybody in illegally or legally. Right. So there has to be some real discussion of truly what do what are our societal values here? And then I think the next piece is, OK, so how do we you know, how do we create a system that aligns with our with those societal values? Um, you know, what does that look like from a um, you know, from an immigration and citizenship perspective, you know, should it be seven years? Should it be sooner? Do we look at what other countries do and adopt some of those things, right? What is that? What does that process look like? Um, and then, you know, money, unfortunately, yeah. right? Like money and funding is necessary to put the proper safety nets in place, right? How are we going to staff up schools? How are we going to staff up hospitals? Again, what is our expectation of, of who pays for that and how it gets paid for? And so, you know, these are, as we're seeing, these are hard issues. And I just oftentimes find that, you know, it's easier to get kind of focused on some of the, the little, um, not quite as hard issues that we can say, hey, I, I checked the box, I did that, right? Yeah, like, um, yeah. So, I, I'm not sure that that's probably not a good answer. If there was an easy answer, somebody would have thought of it. But I do think like societally, we have to decide what we want. And then at the government, you know, federal level, we have to decide like how much money can we put behind this? Yeah, We have to stop checking boxes, as you've said, though, Andrea. People like to check a box and go, oh, I did my part. This is a complex issue. Yeah. And it really, it takes complex solutions and it takes people coming together. And, and as Andrea said, we have to decide as a society where we where we need to go. But too many people want to just check a box and say, oh, look what I did. And yeah. and we're not accomplishing anything. It's more yeah. than that. And, and how, it, it broader policy ideas, visions, I mean, you know, it doesn't need to be, I, I think it's clear it's not one issue, right? It's clearly a combination of factors, but. Yeah, so I think in a sense the world is becoming smaller, right? Yeah. Um, and, and one thing that's not following suit is that international discourse of, you know, sharing best practices, harmonizing of standards, like how do we kind of, you know, commonize and, and leverage best practices across our, uh, our societies uh, to make the most of it? Because we're, and Carla said it earlier, I mean, it's not just a U.S. problem, we're seeing similar problems all over. And so kind of how can we leverage the, the power of, of that collective international community uh, to be, you know, more, more efficient in how we address things, uh, more informed. Uh, and, and I think that that discourse needs to catch up with kind of where we are today. And the second one is the regulatory framework. I mean, some of the laws and the authorities that are in place have been in place for a long time, and it is time to, you know, look at them in concert with um, how we operate today, uh, what technologies we can leverage, and really make those changes so that we can evolve and make the most of, of the tools that are available to us. And that, you know, that's another area that I think, uh, you know, I'll, I'll turn to Congress on that one. I think there's some, some definitely some work that needs to be done there. Yeah, I mean, it's crystal clear. And I was taking some notes while we were talking. And, and it's fascinating. When we set this up, I wasn't expecting this to go in so many different directions. And just some of my notes, I mean, a discussion on societal values, open architecture, 
innovation, civics, mental health issues, supply chain and commerce, humanitarian concerns, right? Like these issues literally touch everything that is at the root of who we are as Americans and what we want to address. So I think it, it, it does require a broader strategy and a comprehensive approach. And there's no silver bullet, I think, as you said. And, you know, maybe to close it out, I mean, Carla, I think the Border Patrol is having a big anniversary next year. Maybe you could just tell us about that real quick and any final thoughts that any of you have for, for the folks listening in uh, today. And just as a reminder, our, our kind of audience, large business audience, policymakers, and nonprofit folks. So I think, you know, the thesis on our talk is each of these buckets, when they come together in the Venn diagram, that little middle part is the secret sauce in society where we solve problems, when you have, you know, good philanthropy and private sector engagement and public sector leadership. So just to keep that in mind. But there's a big, big party next year, Carla. There is. Well, we're hitting the 100 year anniversary of the Border Patrol. It started in 1924. So, um, it, you know, it, it's it's hard to believe how far we've come, you know, and you look at where just to kind of recap where we have come as a nation when it comes to um, our, our borders and just the challenges against it. Um, but it is great to see the support. And you mentioned earlier, you know, the NGOs have really stepped up and, and the support in those areas. Um, uh, the industry side of the house and the support that they provide to the government. There's a lot more that we need to do, um, as we said. And I think when you when you talk about final thoughts, the reason this is so important, the people who are winning in all of this are the criminal element. And it isn't something that we spoke about in depth here, but the cartels are winning here. The human traffickers are winning here because we can't come together as a nation and figure out what our societal values are and how we are going to address it. We put, and because of that, we're putting the men and women in CBP and those working along the border in harm's way, as well as all of our law enforcement in the country. And we are putting these migrants, when we promote illegal immigration, we put them in harm's way. The criminal element are the ones winning here. We need to take that back and we need to figure out, we know how to how to secure our borders. We know how to be good human beings and good humanitarians in doing so. We need to come together as a nation and just, you know, really come together, sit down at the table and figure this out. Right, uh, Andre? I'll, I'll take the innovation view on this. Um, you know, I really believe that the startup ecosystem is a national asset that the United States is not fully leveraging. Um, I think just the smart people that we have, you know, starting companies, um, adapting, you know, bringing agile solutions forward is it sets us apart and is a competitive advantage. Um, I will also say that, you know, in all the work I've done with innovation and in different parts of the government, CBP is truly one of the best at harnessing it. So if you are a startup or if you're really any business that has innovative solutions, CBP is the best right now at, you know, evaluating your technology, mapping it to requirements that they have a need. And most importantly, doing proofs of concept, getting uh, companies on contract quickly so that those companies can turn around to their board, you know, mm -hmm. their investors and show progress and success. And then most importantly, taking those successful proofs of concept and deploying them at scale. So those are all things that I think are really important from a partnership perspective. How does the government show success? How do companies show success? And CBP right now has the mindset of that partnership. So, you know, I'll put that out there as, you know, when I think about things that are going really well, um, innovation is in government is one of them. Perfect. Uh my call to action would uh, piggyback on Andrea's point about innovation, which is for government agencies to follow suit on CBP. And I can see, you know, some efforts on that front, but but also to just look at themselves and their processes and just lower that barrier to entry. Right. Andrea said earlier, it is a slog to work through some of these processes and it's expensive and it's yeah. costly, time consuming. So how do you as a government agency lower that barrier so that you can reap the benefits of you know, that broader stakeholder or innovation community? 
Amazing. Well, ladies, I'm so grateful for all three of you coming on today. I think it was a, a wide ranging conversation. We clearly go on for hours and there's, there's a lot to be discussed. Uh, thank you to everybody who uh, tuned in and watched today. Uh, our next Coffee with Ken is going to be on May 31st. We welcome uh, Maryland Governor Wes Moore for a conversation. Uh, in the meantime, you can visit coffeewithken.com to catch up on past sessions, register for new ones, or subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or Google Play. Thank you so much. Great seeing you. And we will be back next time. Take care. Thanks.